the messages on all the platforms let's illuminate the dark places of the earth as we pray and believe god to reach the hearts of men praying without action is shooting a bullet without direction we have to direct the prayers to where the people are. So share the videos. Put them everywhere where human beings are so that you are directing your prayer to the right targets. But it's exciting to have the word tonight. All over the campuses around the world, we're glad to have all of you brothers and sisters in the service tonight. Glory to God. Amen. Guys, get ready. It's going to be a great time of studies. Everybody in the house excited this evening? Can we give the Lord a great shout as we celebrate the word of his grace? Glory! Amen! Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and your phones. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word of his grace tonight. Uh -uh -uh. Alright, so we're examining the unique revelation of the Pauline theology. We're examining the Pauline revelation of identification. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse number 15, Brother Paul writes a letter to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Next verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness. So it says from a child, the word brephos, from a child, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise, wise unto salvation. Timothy was a close companion of Paul. In fact, outside of Jesus Christ and the father, Paul doesn't mention any personality as much as he mentions Timothy. Timothy is virtually in all of the Pauline letters. The only later you won't find Timothy mentioned is the book of Galatians. And theologians, you know, have agreed that um, the reason why he is not mentioned in Galatians was because the first later brother Paul wrote was the later to the church at Galatia. <clears throat> now, so otherwise, you will find him in all of the Pauline letters. Even the writer of Hebrews included him in Hebrews chapter 13. So he says to Timothy, notice the word wise, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. The word sophizo, S-O-P-H-I-Z-O, sophizo. In other words, Paul is saying to Timothy that he has his own exact skills. That is to say, Timothy has the Pauline skills at interpreting the sacred writings of the Old Testament. And he gives us the explanation that it is salvation, soteria, through faith in Christ. The word pistis, pistis and Christos, or pistis and Messiah. Where he says there is faith in the faithfulness of the Messiah. We will get into that in a bit. We have seen the way Jesus taught. And we observe that Paul never contradicted Jesus. Rather, Paul explained further what Jesus said, and that was what Brother Paul devoted his time in doing in his, in his epistles. And Jesus gave the possibility in John chapter 16, verse number 12, when he said, John 16, 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Next verse. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And we concluded in the last session yesterday, talking about how Paul used the eyewitness account. And then we began to look at how, you know, the temple was an important factor in the explanation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament can, can, cannot be, you know, divorced from the temple. That's why a lot of things are taken from there. The writer of the book of Hebrews did a very good job in talking about the temple. And Jesus used the word worship. Worship in John chapter 4 verse 23 to 24. He used the word worship. Puskaneo. Puskaneo. Worship. Which is obeisance. Which is what the temple was for. Where you pay homage to God. Jesus now says, it is now in spirit and in truth. It is now in spirit and in truth. 
poskenia enai numa aletia that the worship will now be in spirit and in truth the worship the respect the homage you have for god will now be in spirit and that is the reality in spirit will be the reality of the shadows that was exemplified by temple worship that's the way he points it to the woman he takes her attention of mountains and then he takes her attention of a place remember you shall neither in jerusalem nor in this mountain because that's what they were used to temple worship you know where people now are building what they call the pool of bethesda for people to travel to a location to go and meet god taking people back into judaism and, and some kind of idol worship Meanwhile, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, already put a disclaimer on temple worship. You shall neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem where the temple was worship. The time cometh and now is. Now is. And when Jesus was say now is was 2,000 years ago. When true worshippers, so if there are true worshippers, it means... We are true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in reality. You know, the reason for the earth is man. The reason for the earth is man. And the reason for man is fellowship. The reason for the earth is man. And the reason for man is fellowship. And that is important. So Jesus brings that Genesis account order into the way he explains man and worship. And Paul now uses a different phrase. Now don't forget, they are both using temple explanation. Old Testament, Jesus, and Paul. Paul in Philippians chapter 3, again, he is talking about the same thing Jesus is talking about to that woman at the well. Interestingly, she is a Samaritan, which is classified half gentile a samaritan is a half gentile because they are cousins with the jews so paul in philippians chapter 3 verse number one observe the way brother paul now opens up this talk on the temple worship finally my brethren rejoice in the lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe next verse beware of dogs Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Beware of dogs. That's like a signpost on somebody's house. Now, using that imagery or that is figure of speech. Beware of dogs. You know dogs. Dogs were used by Jesus for the Canaanite woman. We shall not give the children's bread to dogs. Beware of dogs. That's in Matthew 15. Again, it's a language that was used in those days. You don't use that language today in communicating with people. Then verse 3, I love brother Paul. Verse 3 of Philippians chapter 3. He says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The same thing Jesus said to the woman. You shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem your time come and now is when through worshippers we worship God in the spirit. Through worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So again, Brother Paul uses the word circumcision. That's a key word because there's a crucial detail with the Jews. Circumcision. You know what Paul is saying here about the circumcision of the heart is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 15. When he says, they draw close with their lips, but their heart is far away. As Paul now says, this circumcision is of the heart. Look at Romans chapter 2 verse 29. Brother Paul speaking to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 2 verse 29. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. 
and not in the later. Whose praise is not of men, but of God. It's the same thing. They will do things in the physical, but Jesus said their heart was far from him. And Paul says this circumcision is not of the later. It's not a physical circumcision. You know, and this is what Jewish people pride in. They pride in the physical circumcision. But brother Paul says it's a circumcision of the heart. And Jesus calls that circumcision the commandment and doctrines of men. The commandment and doctrines of men. It is the same thing in Matthew 15 verse 8. Put it up for me. Matthew chapter 15 verse number 8. You know Jesus speaking says. These people draw it nigh unto me with their mouth. And honor it me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. The same thing Paul now interpreted in Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. Still talking about circumcision. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So brother Paul used circumcision to explain Jesus and worship. And we will do some work on that in a bit. So Philippians chapter 3 verse 3 we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He uses the word luterio, luterio, L-A-T-E-R-E-U-O, luterio, not prosconio, luterio, not prosconio. The word luterio is to serve, to serve, luterio is used for priesthood, priest or those who serve in the temple. It is the same word Jesus used in Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. You shall serve the Lord your God only. You shall worship the Lord your God only. Only him shall you serve during the temptation. And also repeated it in Luke chapter 4 verse number 8. And Paul uses the same word that they all use in Romans chapter 1 verse 9. Give me that one Romans chapter 1 verse number 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. I serve in my spirit in the gospel of his son. That without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, whom I serve. So you won't find Paul use the word priesthood, but he uses the word loterio oftentimes. He doesn't use the word priesthood, because, but he has already implied it by what he said. And mostly it's because he is talking to a Gentile community. Gentiles don't understand all that priesthood stuff. So that's why the only audience that will have the word priesthood used in communicating to them will be a Jewish audience. But then brother Paul implies that priesthood in his discourse when he uses the word loterio. Luterio means to serve God in the spirit. Is that not what Peter was talking about? When Peter says, we are built up a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. What kind of sacrifices? Spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In the book of First Peter chapter 2 verse number 5. First Peter chapter 2 verse number 5. Put it up for me quickly. First Peter 2 5. You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house in spirit and in truth. A spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Then he now explains what he's saying further in verse 9. First Peter 2 verse number 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you shall show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's the same thing he's saying. So Peter uses the word herios in the Greek, which is used for priest. 
But the writer of Hebrews majors on priesthood because he's addressing a Jewish audience. You will see that in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6. You can write down for further study at home. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6. The priesthood of Jesus. Then Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 11. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 20, 21, and 23. I go over the list again. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1, 3, 11, 14, 20, 21, 23. It's a discourse on priesthood. The verb was used in Luke chapter 1 verse 8 as well. That verb. And Jesus also called a priest. Jesus is called a priest after the order of Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 4. I think we have a Melchizedek in the choir. Melchizedek. Well done. No. <laughs> Jesus a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So when you look at the word loterio, which is what priests do, and Jesus being a priest, we are also priests in him. Then Paul is saying exactly the same thing that the writer of Hebrews and Peter are saying, which means it's just his verbiage. So he brings loterio into everyday living that we serve. We serve. He didn't say we are priests, but he said we serve God. Saying we serve God is the same thing as saying we are priests. It's just the polite verbiage because of the audience he's addressing. That's why he comes to say in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service. So, Brother Paul is using that word, you know, reasonable service as reasonable worship. Worship there is service. What is the service? Renew your mind. Be not conformed to this world. Your reasonable service is the renewal of your mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind is your reasonable service unto God. So he talks about service in that, you know, Romans chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. So what he meant by present your body, a living sacrifice, is service. Jesus is also called a priest who serves God, Laterio. And then Paul brings all of that together, all of that priesthood, service, all of it. He now in his verbiage calls it ministers. Ministers. He calls us ministers who also has made us able ministers is the same word for service is the same word for priesthood in the old testament that's just the way paul explains the things that jesus said remember jesus already gave that possibility i have many things to say unto you in john chapter 16 verse 12 but you cannot bear them now how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all the truth when jesus was saying that the spirit of truth when he is come, the person coming was Christ himself. The person that will come, that spirit of truth that when he is come, is Christ himself. When he is come. So there's an explanation as though he is talking about somebody who is not himself. Just take the whole thing together and you will see that the indwelling of God today is in us. Which means the indwelling of God in us is the allos paracletos. The indwelling of God in us is the allos paracletos. In that day, the person that will be in you is the father. And in the father is the son. Or the son in him is the father. In the father is the son or the son in him is the father. And you are also in him. 
That's what he calls the allos paracletos. Another comforter. And Paul will not use the father in him, he in the father, they in you. You know, John said, Jesus said, I and the father will come into you and make our abode in you. Another comforter, a los paracletos. When brother Paul put all of that verbiage together, he calls it in Christ. In Christ. Are you still here? So, in Christ is the fullness of God. In Christ is the fullness of God. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. Colossians chapter 2 verse number 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Next verse. And you are complete in him, which is the head of our principality and power. Which means in Christ is the fullness of God. In Christ is the fullness of God bodily. Is the Greek word somaticus. That is the fullness of God together in Christ. So no doubt the Pauline teachings just advanced. Is Christ in Paul? Is Christ in Paul advancing the things he said in the four Gospels? Christ in Paul advancing the things he said in the four Gospels. Many things to say unto you, you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come? The spirit of truth is Christ in Paul advancing the four gospels. He shall not speak of himself. Look at that John 16, 13 and 14. How be it John 16, 13 and 14. How be it when he the spirit of truth is come. Please watch, pay attention. He will guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak of himself. The original has it. For they shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever they shall hear. That shall they speak. Talking about the eyewitnesses. It is they that will not speak of themselves. It's what they hear the eyewitness. It's not the Holy Spirit that will now be learning and hearing. Who is he hearing from? The Holy Spirit wouldn't be hearing from anybody. So that's a syntax situation there, which cheaply can be fixed by just understanding, you know, the, the original manuscript. Now, observe. So the he, he there is they. All right, and I did some work on it in I think in Christ Realities too. I did quite some 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 work on that. If you get the material, you will find it there. So the day there are the eyewitnesses. Now, don't forget again, Paul, according to Peter, has this Sophia, this you know wisdom, this insight, and he has the way he's going to explain this. In Acts chapter one verse nineteen, we read the other day. Acts chapter 1 verse 19 to 22. We read earlier that the 11 had Jesus say. And they saw Jesus do. So they became the eyewitnesses of the things he said and the things he did. The qualification to be in the apostleship was that you must have been with Jesus from the baptism of John. Till the day in which he was taken. Which means from when they baptized him and the heavens opened. All the teachings, all the activities till his departure, you must have been there to witness them. So that you give credence and give a testimony to the reality of the incarnation and the reality of the Christ. Alright? Then in Acts chapter 2 verse 22, put that up for me. Acts chapter 2 verse 22, <clears throat> please pay attention. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. In the midst of you. Eyewitness. That's an account. And they are crucial to the gospel. 
Because without their witness, we can't say scriptures were fulfilled. And we cannot be talking of resurrection. In Acts chapter 2 verse 22, I witness Acts chapter 2 verse 32. Give me verse 32. Acts chapter 2 verse number 32. This Jesus had God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Acts chapter 3 verse 15. Acts chapter 3 verse number 15. Please stay with me because we have a few to read. And kill the prince of life whom God had raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Are you following? Acts chapter 4 verse 19. Acts chapter 4 verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judging. Next verse. Next verse. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Acts chapter 5 verse 32. Acts chapter 5 verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God had given to them that obey him. Acts 10 39. All of these are critical in establishing that the scriptures were fulfilled and there are witnesses. Acts 10 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of, of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Acts 10, 41. Acts chapter 10, verse 41. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Paul uses these facts. Don't forget, they were kerugmas. These were preachings, and uh, that's really beautiful. It's instructive that Jesus didn't write anything for the disciples. Jesus didn't write any book. He didn't write any manuscripts for them. He just gave them the message in words. He spoke, they heard, they saw. And they, in turn, became witnesses of what they heard and what they saw. And that's how also, you know... Um, John the Baptist and Apollos were instructed verbally. They knew those things accurately. If you're a good student, that's how it works. You pay good attention. And you can actually understand the message very well verbally. The spoken word always comes ahead of the written word. It is spoken so it can be written, so it can be spoken. But it is first of all spoken. The spoken word is first. Speaking is very vital. That's why it's good to be present when something is taught. You know, you can't beat that. Being physically available when we are teaching you. Before you even write anything and take documentations. In Acts chapter 13 verse 24. Acts 13, 24, 25 and 28. When John had first preached before his coming. The baptism of repentance to all the people of the Israel. 25. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I'm not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I'm not worthy to lose. 28, 28. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet they desired Pilate that he should be slain. He quotes John the Baptist. Because these are facts that Paul got from the Kerugma. Up till this point, there was no scripture. Because it was given by oral tradition. Whatever happened to Adam and Eve, whatever happened to Abraham, all of them were communicated via oral tradition. What Moses communicated was a mixture of vision, revelation, and the things he got by oral tradition. Things that were orally said and passed from one generation to another generation like that. Still, it was culture that confirmed, that continued, sorry, with Jesus. A culture of oral tradition. That is how they did it. That is how it was done in the days of Jesus. So Paul uses that frame. Jesus also used that with his disciples. You know, uh, those witnesses whom he called material or disciples. Acts 1.8 
You shall receive power. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. Luke 24, 48. You are witnesses of these things. So now let's look at Peter's writings. Always know what Paul meant by I was not taught of man. Whenever Paul will say, no man taught me, I was not taught of man. You must understand brother Paul's use of words. Are you still here? Hello? Are you in the building? You must understand brother Paul's use of words. What it means is that they knew him for a peculiar insight, a sophizo. He had a precise understanding of Gentile salvation and the details of Jesus' kingdom. That wasn't taught by man. That's what he was referring to. The precision with which he understood Gentile salvation and the kingdom of Jesus, the details. He was not taught by man. But he's not saying that I didn't even know anything about Jesus. Nobody told me anything. I don't know about Damascus. There is nothing like Ananias. I've never had such a name or met such a man before. I just went back to Arabia and everything happened. No, that's not what he said. Even Barnabas took him in. Ananias took him in. All of them took time to teach him stuff. So there's no way he will say nobody taught him. But what he means by nobody taught him is when it comes to the peculiar insight he understood from what they shared with him concerning Gentile salvation and the kingdom of Christ. Is it clear? So, brother Paul now was bringing to the church the advanced teachings of Jesus. He had a peculiar insight. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21, for example. There's a word I want to work on. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. For even hereunto were you called because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Leaving us an example. The word example is the Greek word hypogrammos. Hypogrammos. Like a written copy. It means a modeling. A modeling. Hypogrammos. You will see it in James 5.10. James chapter 5 verse 10. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5. The one in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 is what we call the hypodegma. Hypodegma. Similar to John 13, 15. Hypodegma. Hypodegma. Where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. It's the same word used for temple. Hypodegma. The temple that Moses built. Look at it. Hebrews 8, 5. You know, Christ suffered. Leave us an example. Who serve unto the example, hypodegma. Example, hypodegma, and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for she saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee on the mount. But look at the similarity. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Jesus is not asking them to go and wash people's legs. It's a hypodegma. What he did that day was he washed their feet to demonstrate what he will do on the cross. Remember Jesus' pattern of teaching. He will talk about a natural thing. The moment he gets your attention, he changes the narrative. I don't know if you understand from the things we've been teaching. So, he wasn't saying go and wash people's legs. But he washed their leg as a pointer to what he will do on the cross concerning the washing of our sins. So, it's always a pointer to another issue. A pointer to something else. So when Moses was building the temple, the temple was supposed to point to men. It was not about a temple. The temple was a pointer to a more permanent temple. Hypodegma. The same phraseology here. Alright? Now, 
Look at how Paul uses the word hypodegma. Because not understanding the scriptures, unlearned and unstable, they rest with the scriptures to their own destruction. Hello? We, we took one the other day, I hope. You remember we dealt with one? They didn't understand, so they twisted it. I want to get into something else right now. We dealt with the rapture situation. I want to deal with something else that if you don't understand in the Pauline theology, you will twist the scriptures to your own destruction. Look at how Paul uses the word hypodegma. The same examples. So he goes to the table of Jesus. He goes to the table of Jesus. Obviously, brother Paul must have gotten all of that tradition, the oral tradition from Dr. Luke. In, because in Luke chapter 1 verse 2 to 3, look at it. Luke chapter 1 verse 2 to 3. Put it up for me. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent, Theophilus, to write in order, to arrange the sequence of events, to give you a proper account of the events. And I, as a learned person, I went from the first to study the things by myself. I didn't just rely on what they told me. I went to confirm it. Now, having confirmed it, oh, most excellent Theophilus, I have taken the time to chronologically report these events to you. Only a man like Dr. Luke could have confronted Theophilus because Theophilus was a luminary in that time. So because of his level of intellectualism, they got a medical doctor who was vast to now document chronologically to put the facts before Theophilus. Are we in the building? Now, so, brother Paul got his hypodegma from Luke. Paul now goes to Matthew 26, 28. Please pay attention. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. And in Matthew 26, 28, put it up for me. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Imagine Paul. He is now at that table. And the spirit of truth is in him. He understands the resurrection. Then he looks at that table. And he could hear in his mind. Jesus took bread. He broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. There's about to be a change of narrative. If you are a good student of what I have taught in the past few days. Because he will always use the natural. When he gets your attention, he changes the narrative to an eternal reality. So he takes bread, he breaks it, and he calls the bread his body. Meanwhile, his body is still intact. So he's just getting their attention so he can change the narrative as his pattern of teaching is. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody else. Because there's a consistency in the teaching pattern of Jesus. This is my body broken for you. Just like his teaching culture. This is my blood of the New Testament. His teaching culture is always about a future event. No blood was taken from his body. No flesh was taken out of his body. Then he says, eat my body. Eat my body. He's talking of a future stuff. It will be foolish. Very foolish. Or strange for us to say, just like Jesus did in every service, we are going to be washing your legs. We have become Pharisees. Or in every service, we will eat bread and drink Ribena. We are even worse than the Pharisees. It flows the same way because if you will not wash people's feet in every service, even though some churches do because they are still far from reality, you will not eat bread and wine in every service. What did Paul do in this? He looks at the Passover. 
It's very effective that Jesus didn't die on the atonement day. He died on the Passover. That's instructive. And on the Passover, you know, he brings out the bread that, that was very calculative on the Passover. He brings out the bread, he gives to you, this is my body broken for you. Now remember the temple. You remember the temple? Hello, remember the temple? Destroy and after three days but he spake There was a physical temple standing. Destroy this temple. But he spake of his body. This is my body broken for you. If you will not destroy the temple physically, you shouldn't eat bread and rabina physically. If you shouldn't eat bread and rabina physically, you shouldn't wash feet physically. I don't know if you understand him. He points to the natural, then he changes the narratives. That is Jesus' pattern of teaching. Now, let's dig a bit more. This is my blood of the New Testament. Now, Brother Paul comes to the church at Corinth. And there's a problem of how believers interacted with one another and he uses a hypodigma in the church at Corinth. Listen carefully. How did Jesus use the bread or the living? That bread is not the one he multiplied in John chapter 6 at all. The bread we're talking about now. This is the unleavened bread. When you say unleavened bread or living bread, it has a figure of speech behind it. Living bread, unliving bread has a figure of speech behind it. And Paul says that we are unleavened. We. We. Not bakery bread. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Somebody in the building? Purge out therefore the old living, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unliving. For Christ, even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We are unleavened. Why are we unleavened? Because of the sacrifice of Christ. So unleavened bread is not a bakery bread. It is beneficiaries of his sacrifice that makes us unleavened. That means there is no yeast. We are free from the influence of the world. No yeast. Am I communicating? Communicators, I doubt. <laughs> Sometimes King James English can help us. <laughs> now, stay with me. He calls the behavior of a brother in the church at Corinth living. In 1 Corinthians 5, 8, and 9, that brother that took his father's wife, therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old living, neither with the living of malice and wickedness. Can you see? He has left bread. He has entered their character. He started with bread. Now he moves from bread and calls their character living, which is wickedness and malice. But with the unliving bread of what? Sincerity and truth. Next verse. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators because fornicators are living. You are unliving. He's no more talking of elements now. He has left elements. He used elements to get the attention then because he's using a hypodegma. Please stay with me. So living speaks of influence Living bread speaks of company. Look at the parable of the living in Matthew 13, 33. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13, verse number 33. Matthew 13, 33. Another parable spake unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto living, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was living. Till the whole, that means it spreads. That means living, living 
it is spread. Okay? Look at Matthew 16, 6. Write it down first. Matthew 16, 6. Matthew 16, 11. Matthew 16, 12. And there he says, Beware of the living of the Pharisees. The influence of the Pharisees. So when he brings the unliving bread at the table, now pay attention. When he brings the, living the unliving bread at the table, he is basically saying, this is without sin, without corrupt influence, and this is without the flesh, the unliving bread. So it now becomes a figure of speech. And so Paul comes to the church at Corinth and he says, the same night when Jesus, took, when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke and he said, this is my body broken for you. In the same manner, he took cup. And when he had supped, he said, this is my blood of the New Testament. Eat of it and drink of it. Then he now says to them, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the lost dead Till he comes. That's clear. He's not asking you to be observing Passover feast. In as much as he's asking you to observe Passover feast. He's not asking you to observe Passover feast. In as much as he is asking you to observe Passover feast. The Passover will be the lamb shared among us. The lamb shared among us. The first thing is the lamb. The lamb takes away the guilt of everybody. You remember? On the Passover, when they bring the animal, the animal is brought before the priest. The priest will lay hands on the animal and confess all the sins of Israel. And the animal will take the sins. Then another animal will be killed and offered on the altar. The man that committed sin is not affected. In fact, it is the animal that is investigated and checked. And if the animal is okay, the sinner is asked to go. And remember, he's, he has not been transformed inside. So that means as he's going, he's continuing with his sin. But the only thing is that he keeps another animal for next year. He is sinning, but he's feeding his animal. At the end of the year, he brings the animal. The animal is investigated. If the animal meets the requirements, the sinner is asked to go. And he continues in his sin because the animal is not guaranteed that he will not continue. The animal is to take care of the ones he has done. Then he prepares another animal for the ones he will do. Is it not true? Then at the end of the year, he brings it again. Then he continues and keeps another animal. But so that's what they were doing every year in Israel, which is laborious. So Jesus shows up as the animal. And Jesus is examined. Abel is not examined. Jesus is examined. And Jesus meets the requirements to be the ransom for my sin. So Jesus dies not like a yearly animal, but once and for all. So I don't have to prepare animal because what Jesus did was eternal. What the other animals did was temporal. Why is his own eternal? Because he didn't only pay for sin. After paying for sin, he now has conquered a territory. So because he has conquered a territory, he comes to live inside his territory to secure the territory. Oh, I'm teaching good this evening. So it is because he will now live in the territory. He becomes the guarantor and the guarantee of his salvation. Of his soteria being the sota of the soteria. I don't know if I'm explaining. Now, stay with me because I'm going somewhere with this. So, these people bring animals every year. <clears throat> the Passover, therefore, the animal will be shared among us. The first thing is that the lamb takes on the guilt of everybody. And then now he is shared to everybody. Exodus 12, 13. Now, before the Exodus, before they leave Egypt... That's when it happens. That means that is the sacrifice of Christ that takes us out of the world. 
The Passover is done before they leave Egypt. So that means Jesus is our Passover, meaning he was the one that was offered to take us out of Egypt, which is movement from darkness to light. And the Passover is done once before leaving Egypt. So when Jesus died, my Passover was taken care of. It is on the basis of that that I am now born again. I don't need to be eating and drinking bread that I will go to toilet and push. It has no eternal value. What Jesus did has eternal value. So I stay with Christ, not with bread and ribena. I'm teaching good. Stay with me. Stay with me. Kabodakaya. What it means is that the lamb is a servant. And then the lamb is community. The lamb is a servant and the lamb is also community. What it means is we just as Jesus take on the responsibility now to serve one another. So he says to them in the church in Corinth, I know that there are people among you that are richer than others. In this church, there are people that are richer than others. Some people have cars. Some are still using Legendis Benz. Some people in this church own properties. Others are students. Some can afford not only food, they can afford other things. Others, food is a prayer point. So brother Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, because of the combination of your secular status in one building called the church, he now says to them, when you come together, all of you are one bread. You are one bread. And the moment you eat and don't wait for that brother, you came for love feast. Everybody came with food. A brother didn't have. He brought what he managed to bring. But before he arrived, those of you that brought nice, nice food, some of you could afford to import food straight from America and it arrived within two days. And you brought very nice expensive food. But you ate it in your circle. You are a business CEO. Then you call four other CEOs. You people ate your own food. Then poor people, you push them to one side to gather around Mama Put. And after that, you say you are one bread. After that, you say we are the body of Christ. After that, you say I am bone of your bone. You are flesh of my flesh. Brother Paul is dealing with division in the church. And he's using a hypodegma to communicate. Please stay with me. He said the moment you eat your expensive food... And don't wait for that brother that cannot afford mama put. You are eating damnation. That your food becomes damnation to you. It condemns you. You are denying who you are. You ate and denied a part of your body. Because that brother is a part of your body. But you ate and denied him. So you are fighting yourself. You are segregating against yourself. And as often as you do this this way, you are guilty of the body of the Lord. And he said, this is why some of you are sick. Some of you are weak. And some of you sleep. Because you are now selfish. You come to church, you don't care about the welfare of others. A brother is sick. All it will take for him to be okay is 5,000 naira. But because you don't care for one another, he cannot afford 5,000. Nobody is paying attention to him. Gradually, the sickness kills him. Because none of you care to give him common 5,000. 
He said, that's why some of you are dying. Because there's no care. People are not caring for one another. Some of you are weak. Some of you, you know, you are sick, you are weak. And some of you die. Because people don't care for people. People are don't bother about anybody. That's what Paul was, he was not saying because you didn't eat bread and ribina. That's why you die. What is inside that thing? Paul was using bread and ribina as a hypodegma to bring spiritual realities that just like the body is one and the blood is one and all of us are the body and the blood, we are supposed to also function like that as an entity. And if we don't, some will be sick. Are we teaching? He said, you gather, you say you're coming for the Lord's Supper. Some eat and are drunk. Others are hungry. That narrative is in that Corinthians 11. People say, Dr. Damina say, there's nothing like Holy Communion. But Brother Paul say, as often as you eat it, you like eating. Why don't you eat Jesus' body? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. But what was he talking about? Receive the gospel, believe the gospel. Are we teaching here? So eating and drinking is used in scripture as a hypodegma. It means there's a narrative in it that you need to look out for, not the literal meaning of what is being communicated. That's Jesus' pattern of teaching. And brother Paul expanded it with the spirit of truth and brought the realities out of it. Am I communicating at all? If you're catching this shout, I hear you. Then he now says, if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged together with the world. And that is going on right now. A lot of churches are being judged together with the world because of the kind of selfishness that goes around in many Christian churches where the rich are treated very special in church. They have a different car park for the rich. Poor people have their car park. And in their car park, you will see Kekena Pep with motors, motorcycles. Is it motorcycle or motorcycle? You see Kekena Pep, yellow, yellow Kekena Pep with motorcycle. One section A. Okay? Then there is section VIP. You see Mercedes, BMW, Land Cruiser, Bentley. Lamborghini. It's not tongues. It's the name of a car. <laughs> they have their own section. VIP car park. Admission by invitation exclusive. You know, there are churches where on a Sunday, a pastor is looking for rich people that came. And he will send them special invite. Uh, 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 P.A. come. Invite that one to my office. Invite the other one to my office. Invite that one to my office. Invite that one to my office. And there is lunch prepared for them. The rest go home. Because those ones are potential titers. If we catch this one, their tight will change this ministry. It's an unbelieving segment. It's a sector of unbelievers. You are segregating. You are dividing Christ. You are cutting Jesus' legs and keeping one side from his body. You are removing his life. You are detaching his hand from him. That's why it's condemnation. You are eating condemnation to yourself. He's not talking about bread and ribina. He has left that one long ago. Just like he's not talking of the temple of Solomon. Just like he's not talking about washing your legs. Just like he's not talking about eating literal bread and drinking ribina. Just like he's not talking about going to the temple to worship. You must understand Jesus' narratives. His mode of communication. And brother Paul opened it up for us to catch it well. The corruption of the world should not come into our company. The influences of the world, the way they do things in the world should not be done like that in the church. We must not use worldly classification among ourselves. We must be without living. So Paul used that in Corinth, knowing fully well that they are being influenced by the world. You will see it in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 11. It's a sequence of thoughts. You build into the thought to graduate to 11. You can't talk 11 before reading 5. You can't read chapter 5 without reading chapter 3. 
when he was writing chapter 11, he didn't expect you to arrive at chapter 11 first. He expected you to read chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, 8, 9, 10 to understand chapter 11. You know, that's why when the Pharisee says to Jesus, Jesus, Moses in the law says, divorce your wife. Moses gave permission to divorce your wife. That's Deuteronomy 24. Then Jesus said to them, but what does he say in the beginning? That is before you reach Deuteronomy. How did you arrive there? Why did you jump Genesis chapter 2? Male, he created male and female and said what God has joined together. Let no man put asunder. That is the standard. So don't quote Deuteronomy 24 before Genesis 2. In Bible study, there's a sequence. If you don't understand 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto babes, because you are carnal. So it sets the tone on how communication will be done to that church. That things will be spoken to them like carnal people. Bread and wine to talk about love among brethren. I'm teaching good. Let me round up. So a figure of speech is used to explain love, selflessness, community among ourselves, seeing ourselves as the same. So a figure of speech has now become a church service. Feet washing service. Holy communion service. A figure of speech. They buy bread and wine for you if you can't buy and bring. And some of the wine itself has alcohol. You drink it and start staggering in the church. Your eyes are red like you stole last night. And they're looking for you to arrest. Some of you have been in those churches where they give you alcoholic wine. That came from Rome. Roman chilled alcoholic wine. It's called communion wine. When you taste it, you are tipsy. Because the alcoholic content inside is high level. Since it is a small thing you will drink. So that you can feel it. <laughs> Just take it. Your eye will do like this. Only those of you that used to finish one carton. When you drink it, it's like you drank water. You drink it and you're shining your teeth and smiling around. As if they say, more. <laughs> but JJC, those of, those of you that are new in the game, when you take it, your eye will do, Sha! you stagger some more. Say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> don't, don't worry, Jesus has forgiven you. <laughs> But drinking in his presence. <laughs> Glory! Glory! So it is a figure of what? A figure of speech. Look at Hebrews 9, 23, 24. As I close this service. As I close so we can pray. Hebrews 9, 23 and 24. It was therefore necessary that the pattern. Somebody say pattern. Pattern of things in the heaven should be purified with this. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this. This better. So there's a pattern and there is reality. There's a figure of speech and there is reality. Hypodegma. So the earthly temple was a hypodegma. It points to something else. And that something else is man. The moment the temple becomes heaven to you, you are in trouble. Because every time you hear temple, what should you think of? Huh? Man, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the temple. You are the temple. You are the temple. You are the temple of the Lord. You are the temple. So you are that temple. Man is the temple. The temple of God is not a space somewhere 
Man is God's residence. So that's what Jesus meant when he said they will worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. So can you see that when somebody now does not understand this and now takes it literal and begins to serve people bread and ribena, he, he has he has twisted the scriptures to his own destruction. Those that do not understand Paul's insight, the unlearned, okay, have twisted the scripture. They have made the scripture to say what the scripture was not saying to their own destruction. Praise God. Are we in the building tonight? Say I receive revelation. Say I grow in revelation. Say with me I grow in revelation. Say the eyes of my understanding continually are being enlightened. Stand on your feet everybody. Glory to God. Say with me very loud I am the temple. Turn to your neighbor say neighbor. Whenever you hear temple. Don't think of Jerusalem. And if you think of Jerusalem, I am the Jerusalem. I'm the temple of the Lord. I'm the temple of his glory. I house his glory. Oh, somebody's not saying that like you know what they're talking about. I house his glory. I am the temple of his glory. Can somebody shout glory? Say I house God. Amen. Lift your hands and begin to thank God for all of this glory, this revelation, this insight that he has made available to us. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jes